Good morning, everyone. Welcome to session three. I am Corinne DeLeon and I work for Seattle Public Utilities and I will be moderating this session. I am so grateful to be here virtually with all of you today. This session is titled Stepping In and Stepping Up, Equity in Action, given by Nikki Pozos and Jesse Moran. Nikki brings a diverse background encompassing a PhD in civil engineering, former work as a life coach, as well as a marketing manager for a water business group for 50 professionals. Nikki is multiracial and considers herself both white and a person of color. She is a recognized leader in equity within the water industry, serving as a minority evaluator for the city of Portland and is the current president of the nonprofit Women Leading Water. Jesse transforms vision into reality and has successfully leveraged her background in urban design, graphic communications, operations and project management skills into a respected business operations and development practice. Jesse is a passionate climate and sustainable transportation advocate in her Southeast Portland community and has facilitated and organized events to enact change through outreach and engagement. Welcome, Nikki and Jesse. Thanks, Corinne. Thank you, Corinne. Every time I hear a bio, I think, gosh, I've got to start writing those shorter. So I'll make that a personal goal. Um, thank you for um, having us here this morning. Um, we're going to be talking about equity and um, one of the things I've always appreciated about uh, Women in Water and the Women in Leadership Symposiums is really um, thinking about our personal engagement with leadership and with our work. And that's really what we're going to be doing today with equity is talking less about um, kind of the st systemic side of it and more about our personal action. Mm -hmm. I think we can go to next. Except for some reason, there's nothing on the slide. <laughs> Not sure what's going on there. Um, so maybe try clicking again, David. Okay. That works. Um, so equity is about power. And I've said this a lot of times in the last few years, but for some reason, this is really in my face right now with the work that we're doing. You know, we work with um, public utilities and also in my personal life, um, you know, looking at our school. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And Jesse's been working around houselessness. And this has just been really coming up a lot. And equity really is about power. It's about who has the power, who has the influence, and how they choose to use it, how they share it, and how they give it away. So next. So equity is not just about having the right political beliefs or values. Um, I, I think there's been such a huge drive. I mean, there were so many public statements around Black Lives Matter. and there are so many book clubs and so many trainings and so many educational events right now. And, you know, not that everybody here is necessarily the same, but a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest have, I say they've liked all the Facebook posts around social equity and supporting people of color. And I think there's kind of this underlying assumption that if we build awareness and we educate ourselves, that that is naturally going to produce action. And um, a lot of what we're talking about today is I don't find that to be the case. I find that in a lot of cases, we can have all the awareness in the world, but somehow when it comes to take action, we don't. And if there's one goal that we have here today is for you to think about your own actions or lack of actions and, and do differently because it is something we really do need to practice. Uh, next. So I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, why is this? Why is it that we can have these values? Um, and I do think people really do have these values. I, I don't think it's just that people are saying it and they don't really value it. But why is it that we can have these values and hold these values? And yet, when the rubber hits the road, it doesn't happen. And I think part of it is lack of knowledge of people who are not like ourselves. I think we want to have values that we support those people, but if we don't know them, um, we often don't hit the mark when it comes to take action. And I also think we're just blind to our own blindness. Um, I think we are very unaware of the power that we do hold. And I would say because you are here at this summit that you have quite a reasonable level of power and influence your life, whether you acknowledge or feel, com feel comfortable using it or not, you know, you have a certain income level. A lot of us are very highly educated. Um, most of us have very stable jobs. 
Um, there's a lot of types of power and influence that we have in our daily lives. It's just when things are normal to us, especially if we grew up in a family where our parents maybe had a similar level of influence and power, we just don't really notice it. We don't see that as influence power is just, it's just living. So I think we really are blind to what we do have available to us. And when we don't see the power that we have, it's very hard for us to use it effectively. And um, I caught a little bit at the end of, of Stephanie's presentation there. Um, I know there was, she was talking a bit about how we use our power to, um, to advocate for ourselves. And I think of some of that same awareness of the power that we do have, we can use a lot of those same tools to really advocate for others. So next. So we're gonna try doing a little exercise. I know there's many, many of you out there. Just write down the names if you have a piece of paper or in your head if you have to, of the five people who are closest to you. And I decided we could include family. Okay. <laughs> we had a lot of debate back and forth about that, um, but just, we're going to give you two minutes. One of the things I was thinking, Nikki, while you were talking about the lack of knowledge of people who are not like ourselves and the blindness to our own blindness, um, is that sort of creating a bubble where it can be really challenging to see what the options are or a route to action because there's not even a sense of a possibility outside of the power that we hold. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes that can lead to a fear of stepping outside of that once you become aware that there is a, an opportunity for action or an opportunity for power sharing. But definitely, as we've heard in recent conversations that we've had with clients, a fear of losing that power or losing ground in a sense, once you begin to step out of that. That's a good point is that I, I think we're also blind to the fact that we do want to hold on to our power and that we do want to hold on to what we have. And sometimes taking action does come at a personal cost or at least the risk of a personal cost. And often we, we shy away from that risk. Yeah. I think we can have the next slide now. So the question of those five people you wrote down is how homogenous is your inner circle? You know, are they the same race as you? Do they have the same educational level? Do they earn around the same amount of money? And uh, do they share your politics? Whatever those politics are. Um, and I think there's been a lot of focus on social media and the idea that we can live within a, like a news bubble. But sometimes I think that the personal bubbles that we live in are actually more powerful in how we take action. I kind of feel like those news bubbles affect a lot of like the words we say and the language we're using and kind of our beliefs that we're having. But when it comes to taking personal action, our personal bubbles and experiences, I think have a huge influence. And I was curious if um, you can use the chat. We'll see if this works. I know there's a lot of people. I don't, I was curious if people wanted to comment on how homogenous their bubble is. And I would say not everyone's is, is super homogenous. I will say mostly my five people who are closest to me are, are pretty darn similar to me. And, you know, I'm an equity consultant, so I'm not here to judge you for this. Mm -hmm. um, for me, as I think about this exercise, I realize that I have some diversity in the first three, but not a lot of diversity in politics. So politics is, is really where my, my inner circle, the people closest to me are, are most homogenous. Mm -hmm. And I admit for me, I, the reason why I decided to include family is I think when we think about family, you know, our family does not necessarily have the same education level um, mm -hmm. and sometimes not the same race as us um, and don't necessarily earn around the same amount of money. You know, my sister never went to college and she's a blue collar worker. And I, I always say it kind of keeps me honest of not being completely stuck in my ivory tower existence. So... So we do want to push you to share a little bit in the chat about your inner circle and it, its composi composition and how that might affect your ability to sort of be self-aware or understand self-interest, to think about um, how you could advocate for or even understand uh, differences among folks. Yeah, and I saw a couple comments, like um, one person commented they're an immigrant and they have a non-homogenous group, which is awesome. Um, I also get that there's a comment here and like, this is weird, like, yes, I, I don't want to say, you know, find the, a Black person and make them your friend intentionally. What I would say is we, we are kind of blind to how we don't take the opportunities to know people who are not like us. So, um, 
you know, my, my son identifies as Mexican. He's half Mexican and he, um, he has a lot of brown friends and he happens to be in a friend group that has a lot of, of non-college educated families in his friend group. And, you know, when you look at your kids' friends, for example, if you have kids, mm -hmm. there's always opportunities to maybe become friends with those parents or not become friends with those parents. And you might find that maybe the parents who were more obviously like you are the ones you end up being friends with. So it's not necessarily that we have to do something completely artificial to engage with people who aren't like us. Often there are opportunities that arise. Maybe it's a person at work. Is it the person who seems like us that we take to lunch? Or is it a person who doesn't seem like us? So I don't think you have to do it completely artificially. I think we really underestimate um, what opportunities come into our lives and how much we're filtering people for whether they're a person we wanna be with or a person we don't wanna be with. And so what we're asking here is, is to build a practice of self-awareness around the choices that are made, because those very subtle choices that are made about um, who you're taking to lunch or uh, which parent you walk up to and talk to back when we could walk up to people and talk to them um, is what forms your inner circle and what forms your awareness of the world. And um, it also forms the boundary of what feels possible in terms of action uh, based on actual understanding. Also, some people are saying, you know, a couple people stand out as being less homogenous than the others. It is interesting to think for yourself, how is that effective affected how you see the world when issues come up how does knowing those people who are different from you maybe change your perspective on things mm -hmm. so i think we can move to the next so i'm going to tell a bit of a story of my school because i think it really um demonstrates the principle mm -hmm. here and uh so our i my kids go to school it's an environmental school it's very very liberal it is very much majority white, and it is very much holds racial equity um, as a high and prominent value. And um, there is a very rigorous training and constant discussions about it. So it, it is a very central part of the school, despite it being majority white. So next slide. So one thing that's been going on right now in Portland uh, has been that the school district, Portland Public Schools, has been considering huge changes to school configurations and boundaries. And the goal is, uh, one of the goals is supposed to be increasing equity um, for students of color. And um, PPS has hugely disparate outcomes for students of color, in particular black students. So it's gonna have a big impact. Or this, this is a huge study. It's looking at how they do Spanish immersion programs. A lot of those are serving um, English language learners. And it's disrupting a lot of schools and moving a huge number of things around. And like I said, one of the main goals is to increase equity. So you think, well, being that we're a school that's really held equity as a high value, of course, we're gonna be interested in this study. And indeed, a number of parents at our school did step up and try to get everyone riled up to oppose the changes. You go to the next slide. But it might surprise you what they were advocating for. The thing they really didn't like about what was proposed is that our students were going to have to move from a more diverse high school to a less diverse high school just because of, of numbers and population. And the less diverse high school we we're going to have to go to is a very highly rated school with excellent programs and everything else. So go to the next slide. So in the end, even though this was going to affect many, many kids of color and many disadvantaged populations within Portland, the real thing that they had a problem with is that white families didn't think that their white children should have to go to a less diverse school. And why should their white children not have to go to that school? Because equity and diversity are so important at our school, so they shouldn't be subjected to that. And what they didn't do is feel any responsibility to know about how, their, how other people were being affected by the changes or any responsibility to advocate for anyone except their own children. And of course, they didn't frame it, my child. They said, our children. But what they mean when they said our children is children who are exactly like my child. So they're framing it as a we, but they really are only coming from their individual perspective. And to me, this is really galling. Like, we're supposed to be all about equity. And every time a real problem comes up, 
suddenly people are not um, are not holding that as a value or feeling any responsibility to it. So can you switch to the next slide? So I see when people go to exercise their power, they feel that they have a right and maybe even a responsibility to advocate for their own child, family, or group. And the thing about this is it gets tons of support. When you advocate for your own in-group, if you're surrounded by your in-group, when you advocate using the we language, you get a ton of support for that. And um, it feels really good advocating for your in-group. And when you go against that in-group, it feels very difficult. Um, it feels like you might harm your personal relationships. And it's very hard. However, what this really is, if you can switch to the next slide, is that I have a right to reinforce the existing power structure when it serves me or my family or my group. I have that right. The challenge is when we think of the world, everything that happens touches somebody. So if every time something touches us personally, we retain the right to advocate for ourselves and use our power for ourselves, what we're really saying is that we don't support creating a more equitable world. Jesse, I feel like you're gonna comment on that, no. <laughs> no, I feel like that needs to just sit there. <laughs> and I see this again and again. And when people are doing this, they don't see it or they think that it's an exception because it's so close to home. The problem is everything's an exception to somebody. Mm -hmm. So can you switch to the next slide? So that's really why all of this learning we're doing and these book clubs and all this, I have not seen it convert into more equitable outcomes. And that's why you can have some place like living here in Portland where everybody believes in equity and likes all the right Portland, uh, right uh, Facebook posts, that somehow we're not a city where most people of co color feel comfortable or where a lot of people of color feel comfortable. And we're not a city that's getting equitable outcomes. So we wanna reiterate, you know, that, that notion of awareness and the book clubs and the conversations and the social media are a way of educating oneself potentially, of building awareness. But awareness doesn't is not the same as action. So it's a bridge between ignorance and action, but it's not the doing itself. So in the next half of our presentation, we're just gonna use some examples and some discussion to talk about how we, can we move to the next slide? Start to begin to actually share our power. And part of that power sharing is learning to let go of your own self-interest and perhaps even stepping back a minute to understand what your own self-interest is in a given situation and developing the skills and the comfort with advocating for the benefit of someone who's not immediately in your in-group. So examining your self-interest and practicing power sharing at, at beginner levels. So why don't we move to the next slide? And I was just gonna comment, someone had recommended the podcast, Nice White Parents in the chat. I know the chat's gonna go by really quickly, so. Um, I actually can't see the chat. So yeah. if, you can pull that, if you can comment on that, that'd be helpful. I haven't um, listened to that myself, but it sounds like uh, right along the lines of what we're talking about, so. Yeah. So in this first example, we have these words on the slide about if you're white, be the one to call out racism and be the one to do the work. Um, and there's a great line in a recent movie, Tenet, about we all think we'd be the one to go into the burning building and save someone. But when you're actually there and you feel the heat, many of us will, won't. So I heard about um, a situation recently from a professional colleague. Um, this was a Zoom meeting, a uh, project meeting. A group of folks were talking through the community engagement um, approach for, for this large infrastructure project. And somehow in that conversation, in that back and forth, uh, the N-word was spoken. Full out, no euphemism was stated, uh, not directed at someone, but used. And no one commented. There was no feedback. There was no noting at that moment. Um, and the meeting went along. So the participants in this meeting were primarily white women. There were a couple of brown women and one, one black woman. Um, 
after the meeting, she did comment on it, but no one else did. At a subsequent meeting, there were um, there was some defensiveness that happened. The woman who spoke the word um, excused herself um, as someone who did no longer felt safe expressing herself in conversation. And in the background, um, the black woman was receiving these sort of one-to-one -one conversations, one-to-one -one messages that were messages of support and solidarity, um, apologies for what had happened, but nothing came out on the surface. So she felt very, very alone in this situation. So in this sense, there wasn't really, there wasn't anyone who stepped in to call out this racism in a public way. And I'd like to, you know, just posit the question, what was the self-interest that kept any call out, any public statement of support from being made? And given that this was a work situation, this was um, folks representing a couple of different companies coming together to work on a project, that there was a fear of being branded as a troublemaker, of saying the wrong thing, of um, potentially damaging one's own professional reputation. And I've thought of this one a lot before is like people constantly are saying they don't know how to interrupt discrimination or racism. Like I've heard that a million times from a million people. And what I really think they're asking me is, I wanna know how to disrupt discrimination without having to take any personal risks or pay any cost. I wanna be able to do it for free. And it turns out that it doesn't come for free. Um, when we interrupt discrimination, it does take a personal risk. We are, um, and when I think of that situation, I think those people who are sending those silent emails to her are, are trying to not have to pay any personal cost and still give themselves the, the pat on the back that they did the right thing. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the practice might be in the moment, pausing, making a, a note that something just happened that was impactful and traumatic. It might be at the end of the meeting making that note. It might be following up the meeting with a shared email to all of the participants acknowledging what happened and its impact. So as Nikki was, was commenting earlier, just because the moment passes doesn't mean that the opportunity passes. So is as this practice is coming into play, as one is learning how to take on the cost, to let go of one's own self-interest, to advocate for the benefit of someone who's not in your in-group, the first step may be small, but that begins to build the muscle and the comfort as an individual to have the courage to step in to that conversation, to step into that moment. And at a past PNCWA conference, there was um, once somebody who used the term um, gay in a derogatory manner. Um, and they knew when they did it. And um, it was in one of our full day events. And I ended up talking to them about it at lunch and saying, hey, you can't just leave that out there. And they really did do the thing that they should have done, which is come back and apologize and acknowledge what had happened. And I think there are other options besides leaping up at the table and pointing at someone and yelling racist. And um, we, we, we sometimes act like, cause we lost that, that there's no options, just like Jesse's saying. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide? So in this, we talk about, again, reiterating that idea of getting to know the people that you want to advocate for. And so I think it was mentioned earlier, I live in Sunnyside neighborhood um, and are, am participating with my neighborhood association and beginning to develop the strengths of advocating for our houseless neighbors, the folks who are living on the streets in our neighborhood. And when we started this work, we had all of these ideas about how we were gonna create places out there, over there where those people could go um, and they would be well cared for and um, everything would be fine for them. Magically, the discomfort that we were experienced, experiencing as housed people um, would, would go away and we'd be, we'd be unbothered. We could, we could enjoy our neighborhood without the trash and without the discomfort and without the conflict. And as we started to do this work, starting to provide showers, show up at the lunches that were served, um, get to know individual, the individual folks who are living on our streets, we learned that um, many of us who are living in houses were the newcomers. 
You know, we were meeting folks who went to the neighborhood school, who grew up in this neighborhood or who had been living here either originally in houses or on the streets for decades. So we started to realize that we ourselves um, were the peers or perhaps even the latecomers to a situation. And we started to understand and shift our perspective and recognize that part of what we needed to understand from our neighbors was where they wanted to be housed and what was the reason for staying here. It had a lot to do with familiarity and comfort and relationships, family networks that happen across housed and unhoused folks in our neighborhood. So it allowed us to shift our perspective and shift our action to work in collaboration with the folks we were ho hoping to serve rather than sort of against or on top of or um, at a distance from. So again, this is not, not advocating for the idea, not positing the idea to go out and befriend a homeless person or go out and befriend a particular type of person. It's to recognize that when you think that you're serving someone, you can have no true understanding of someone's experience or perspective or needs uh, without actually knowing an individual person, without actually knowing someone personally by name. I admit, I do always advocate for people to be friends with at least somebody on the other side of the political spectrum. They don't have to be in your top three or something, but um, I do think there um, there is a huge loss of understanding in, in, in so many different realms when we don't have any direct experience of people. Yeah. Just wanted to come back um, relative to working with unhoused folks in our neighborhood. We've really seen a reiteration of that point you made earlier, Nikki, about um, every situation touches someone. Mm -hmm. So I've talked to a lot of neighbors who feel very compassionate, feel very concerned about the health and well-being of the folks on the street, but just don't, just can't have these people in front of my house. You know, I just need them, you know, they can go down the street, they can go to a, some other neighborhood, just kind of go, go down over there, out of my sight. And seem to sort of illogically not understand that that means that that person is moving in front of someone else's house. So when you are asking to not be bothered or not be impacted, you are taking your problem, your discomfort and putting it into someone else's lap. So part of this exercise that we're talking about, about sharing power, about learning to identify your self-interest, about learning to step in, is to recognize that when you have a challenge, when you have a conflict, when there is an issue that you are adjacent to, it is your responsibility to step in and begin to be a part of addressing that issue rather than setting it aside and pushing it somewhere else for someone, somewhere magically else to deal with. And the truth is when people think of houselessness, a lot of the way that they're wanting is to push them into lower income neighborhoods that are um, further away and people might have less influence to keep them out. <laughs> How about the next slide? So this is um, maybe coming back a little bit into the project realm. I think many of us pre-COVID times have been in a public meeting, whether it's a, a large community meeting or a small kind of stakeholder engagement. And I hopefully have recognized that the, the representation in that room is fairly homogenous, that they're, you know, uh, there may be an effort to sort of represent the community when getting input, but the folks who are actually in that room um, are a small sort of subset. It may be because the meetings held during the day when a lot of folks are working, there can be a, a lot of reasons for that. But this is an opportunity to identify, again, self-interest and practice. And I was thinking about the self-interest here a little bit. And for me, it, it took a moment to sort of identify, and I think it comes back again to that first piece we talked about, that when we get to the point of being in a meeting that someone else has arranged and invited folks to come to, we don't necessarily want to call out that there's a problem here in the moment, and we don't necessarily want to call out as consultants or professional folks that the outcome, the input gained from this meeting is flawed. So again, there's a, self, there's a self protection, a professional protection that happens of not necessarily feeling comfortable being perceived as a troublemaker or being perceived as someone who um, is criticizing a colleague or is criticizing the data or the findings that come out of an engagement. And as Nikki stated in the beginning, what we're talking about here is as individuals who happen to be professionals, what is our responsibility 
in terms of increasing advocacy, advocacy, increasing equity and increasing power sharing. So in this case, again, it might be an opportunity to kindly, gently point out the absence, to push back on the client or the arranger of this, this engagement to talk about how we might in the future uh, address the issue or how we might um, think about the qualifications of the findings, what feedback we get from that. So starting to think about improving the processes and the methodology going forward. I also think sometimes we might be the one giving input, maybe at a public meeting, or maybe we're giving commentary, you know, we're giving online comments, maybe we're calling up this principal or calling up an organization to complain and to really challenge ourselves um, of how much is what I'm advocating for just representing my we, which is really my I, <laughs> mm -hmm. and how much am I really considering other people? And one of my latest pet peeves is people who I say they just put a BIPOC on it. I already believe this thing. And after saying why I believe it, I'm gonna come up with some rationale why it's better for BIPOC people, black indigenous and people of color. And I'm just gonna slap a BIPOC on the bottom of my reasoning. And what I don't see is people advocating for BIPOC against their own interest. It's never like, wow, for me, I would prefer this, but I've realized through doing research or talking to people that for BIPOC, it would actually be better to do something different. And that's why I'm advocating for something different. I never see that, but I see over and over again, the thing that I want is also better for BIPOC. So I'm just gonna write that sentence at the bottom just to show that I, I'm all about BIPOC support, so. Let's go to the next slide. This comes out of, this is one that's near and dear to our hearts. It comes out of the work that we do supporting um, minority owned businesses in teaming in the professional um, arena. And again, what we often find is that we're accustomed as consultants, many of us to teaming with minority owned firms to get the percentage points. And this may or may not be a teaming that really serves that, that business or really serves their long-term goals or even actually results in any work, um, paid work. It may uh, result in quite a lot of effort expended in order to participate in that teaming effort, um, but it may result in no actual contract or paid work that comes out of that. So again, what we're talking about here is actually getting to know the needs um, and the goals of the firms that you're working with, the firms that you are looking to team with, and sharing your influence and contacts in a way that serves their interest as self-identified mm -hmm. interest so that you're moving forward and, and supporting those firms in growing and expanding and building capacity and becoming and finding their own place in the marketplace, moving beyond just one's own need as a company to get points and to look good to your clients and, and your marketing managers. So an example is for a lot of firms, they don't have the capacity to be able to know everything going on in the marketplace because they might only be a few people. And even though I used to be a marketing manager, I find this about myself, like being just such a small company, you can't have the market awareness that you had when you were a big group of people. Um, but it's just really rare that people ever share what's coming up. I, I know some organizations do, that some public organizations do, but I don't see consultants sharing what projects are coming up or helping their DBEs get on different teams. And that's what would actually help their business. Instead, I see people trying to hoard their DBEs, like hopefully I came up with a better strategy than everyone else and I'm going to, um, if anything, try to stop them from getting on other teams so that I can look better. And I, I realize that there's marketing interest and there's competitiveness in this, but there's also, um, let's own that. If that's what you're doing, at least own it. And people sometimes ask us like, what's different about what you do for small businesses than what we would do? Cause we always mentor our firms and everything. And I'd say the number one thing we do differently is we put them first. And I just don't see people doing that. Um, and I get that when you're delivering a project, they can't always be first. The project has to come um, first at times, but overall, when we think of our overall relationship with these firms, um, the level of investment we have in their success that's not just aligned with our own self-interest tends to be very low in my experience. So it looks like it's time for us to move to Q&A. So perhaps we go to the next slide, which is our first question for you. 
I also realize there's a couple questions that came up in the chat. Sorry, I haven't kept entirely up with the chat. Um, I see Shelby's question here. What guidance do you have for firms who are trying to advocate for DMWSB firms, but in doing so, the firm feels tokenized? I guess um, they feel tokenized by your advocacy. I'm a little lost on that one, actually. <laughs> the idea that if you try to help them, that they'll feel, maybe you don't mean tokenized, maybe you mean condescended. Um, I would say that I um, connect people to Primes and um, when I hear about opportunities I think would be a good fit for a firm, I'll tell them about it. I help connect them to the Prime. I help tell them what's great about that sub so that they can have that opportunity. When I'm talking to a firm about a project and I think there's any opportunity for one of the subs I know, I always bring it up, even if it's not a DBE type project. So I have never had a firm dislike me trying to help them get work. So I want to tag on to another question that came up with that answer, Nikki. How do you advocate for someone else's interest without substituting your judgment about their interest for theirs? And I think key to the point that you were just making and in response to this question, ask people, talk to people about what their, their interests are and believe them. So um, rather than when we're substituting our judgment for someone else's, we're assuming that they don't know what's best for them. They don't know what their own needs are. So having, having a conversation and believing what you're, he you're hearing are maybe two key pieces to being able to advocate for someone else's interest. Um, I, there's also a question here about, does it help for people to have goals? I do think it's helpful for, for entities to have goals. I know a lot of organizations are considering doing a DMWSB or WIMB. It's a different term everywhere, goals. And I think those do matter, but I, I do think sometimes when we think about equity, people rely too much on that one um, lever or lever or whatever we say here in this country. It's my Canadian accent. <laughs> people rely too much on that to the exclusion of all other things. So, um, I, so I, I do support that and I think it's important. I also see that as all entities just try to up those percents that we need to do a lot more to support firms in growing um, and bring new firms on to actually meet all those percents. And then we can't just rely on that as the one thing that we do. There's a lot of other things as public entities and as individuals that we can be doing to advocate and create opportunity that's not just that one thing. Mm -hmm. Nikki, there's another uh, question that Corinne popped up. Where can I find businesses that are WMBE that I can support? I mean, there are, um, it depends on what market you're in, but uh, I know Seattle for one has um, really big networking events that primes and subs can connect with. Um, there's in Oregon, you have OWAMI, the Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs. Um, and a lot of it is probably there's already people at your firm who already have firms that they work with. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting curious about it and trying to meet people and looking around, you can easily find people on the internet um, and get curious about meeting those people and learning more about what they do. So I also saw someone here is mentioning that someone who used to work at a small business, helping people get technical experience that can um, that they can put on their resume is really important too. So all those things do matter. So I'm curious why we're, um, are the, our questions really focused on um, teaming opportunities or are we getting questions and feedback since I'm not seeing the chat yeah. on some of the other topics that we talked about? We've kind of gone down the um, DMWs. <laughs> so uh, someone did ask a question here, what's the biggest way we could have an impact as a junior employee or engineer? Um, I get that as a junior employee, you don't have the same level of power as a project manager or a, a manager. Um, I think when you think of your role in your community, you still are a person with a lot of power. Um, if you can still use your influence to help others in the community. And if you're on a project team, you can be that voice and advocate for those firms, or you can be a voice or advocate for those communities on projects. You know, we do projects all the time where we're not thinking about the people who live in that neighborhood, really, or maybe the less visible people who, who live in that neighborhood, not those same 
10 people who come to all the project, the uh, public meetings. So you can still, even if you're a junior person, you could always say, um, you know, are we missing a voice here? Have we considered this? Um, and I think someone said it really nicely about 30 comments up, um, had worded it really nicely, the public meeting, like, hey, I've noticed this group isn't here. What do we think they would say? How could we hear from them? You can we say those things. Sounds like we need to transition. Yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. That was very motivating and inspiring, but unfortunately we're out of time. So thank you so much, Nikki and Jesse. That was great conversation and great discussion. So for those of you that may have more questions or want to hear more about the topics that we're discussing today, there will be networking sessions at the end of the event, as we've mentioned. So if you want to hear more from Stephanie, Nikki and Jesse, or our panelists, please join us there at 1130. Now I will pass it over to Pratisha Kanzakar, who will lead us in an icebreaker next. Thank Join you so much. There. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And what a great conversation. Thank you, Nikki and Jesse. Um, I'm here kind of for a change of pace with a little game, an icebreaker game. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pratishta, and I'm really excited to be part of this virtual summit. And I have to say that I'm not surprised that the summit has set the record for having the highest number of attendees compared to all other previous summits. Uh, it would have been really nice to meet you all in person and network, but nevertheless, I have a fun game that we can all participate in. Um, so the rule of the game is simple. I have a list of amazing and very inspiring ladies, and I'll be giving you clues for you to guess who she might be. Um, and you can type in your guesses at the, as the chat, in the chat boxes as the clues roll out. And um, we have compiled women from different fields and genres. Uh, some are easier to guess than others, so it'll be really fun. All right, so let's get started. Let me just share my screen. All right. Oh, give me a second here. I'm trying to figure out the which screen I'm sharing. Okay, let's start with an easy one. She said, when they go low, we go high. She won a Grammy Award for her audiobook for Best Spoken Word Album in 2020. Oh, wow, the guesses are coming so fast, guys. Um, she also let, uh, led the Let's Move campaign aimed to reduce childhood obesity and encourage a healthy lifestyle in children. And she graduated from Princeton with a degree in sociology with a dissertation titled Princeton Educated Blacks and Black Community. Oh, my goodness, you guys are on a roll here. Yes, she's Michelle Obama. All right, ready for the next one. She said, being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Let's see. Oh my goodness, the guesses are already rolling in. Uh, she's the youngest poet to deliver an inaugural address and a first national youth poet laureate in 2017 at 19 years old. Um, we can't tell, but she has a speech impediment because of a chronic ear infection as a baby. And she also found a nonprofit called One Pen, One Page to empower youth to use their voices and help eliminate inequality through education. All right. Yes, it's Amanda Gorman. Okay, ready for the next one. She said, great minds talk about ideas, average minds talk about events, and simple minds talk about people. All right, no guesses yet. She protested uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama's segregation laws in 1938. All right, no guesses yet. She was a United Nations delegate and became a driving force behind the first Declaration of Human Rights. 
No guesses yet. All right, last cl clue. She's known for being one of the most outspoken first ladies. Yes, Roosevelt, one of you guessed it, right? All right. Um, more guesses coming in. Okay, next one. This is a lady from a different field. So um, let's start it. Let's get started. So she quit opera to become a cheerleader. She was thinking of becoming an environmental lawyer, but she slept through an exam and took that as a sign that the career path was not for her. No guesses rolling in yet. She donated her entire salary for a movie where she portrayed the former British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher's character. Okay, that should be, there it is. Okay, more guesses coming in. She has more Academy Award nominations than any other female, 20 nominations and three wins. Okay, that is a giveaway. Yes, it's Meryl Streep. Okay, next. Uh, her father gifted her with a toy animal when she was just one year old, and she later on would become the world's foremost expert in this animal. Oh my goodness, you guys are so good. Okay, guess is coming in. Okay, she observed animals from a young age, when she, uh, and once she sat for five hours in family's chicken coop to watch a hen lay egg. She traveled to Africa when she was 23 year old, 23 years old and was hired as an anthropologist um, and an assistant to anthropologist. You guys are guessing so fast that I feel like I have to speak fast too. Uh, she was one of the first PhD students accepted by university without a college degree, later graduated with the PhD in ethology. All right, yes, it's Jane Goodall. Okay, next one. She once said, when the world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. She's the youngest to receive Nobel Peace Prize at 17 years old. Yes. She was only 11 when she started blogging about what life was like under the Taliban for BBC. And in 2007, when she was just 15, a Taliban Taliban gunman boarded the bus and shot her in an assassination attempt. That's correct. It's Malala. All right. Okay. First job, her first job was as a tutor in math and computer programming. She founded Pivotal Ventures in 2015 as an independent organization to identify, develop, and implement innovative solutions to problems affecting women and families. No guesses yet. Authored the book, The Moment of Lift, Empowering Women Changes the World. You guys are getting it. Co-chair to a foundation with a nearly 50 billion endowment with a mission to help all people lead healthy, productive lives. Yes, it's Melinda Gates. All right, we have time for a couple more here. She was born in Paia on the island of Maui in Hawaii. She was instrumental in passing civil rights law in 1972 that prevents sex discrimination in federally funded education institutions. She was rejected from more than a dozen medical schools because she was a woman and then faced discrimination as a practicing lawyer. Okay, last clue. She was the first woman of color and first Asian American woman elected to the House of Representatives. Yes, it's Patsy Mink. I saw one guest come through. All right, maybe time for one more here. In 2014, Forbes rated her the 22nd most powerful woman in the world. She stated, I realized I was more convincing to myself and to the people who were listening when I actually said what I thought versus what I thought people wanted to hear from me. And I think this is kind of the theme of conversations we've been having um, since morning as well. 
She joined in 1980 as a mechanical engineer summer intern and became the CEO in 2009. Lots of guesses, but not any right guesses yet. Among other civic positions, she was a leader of STEM program of the White House and head of President's Export Council um, in the past. <laughs> uh, she is Ursula Burns. Somebody guessed it to be me. That's funny. Okay, time for one more. She was a consultant for 2014 Hollywood movie Selma based on the Selma to Montgomery voting rights marches. She founded the nonprofit Just Be in 2003, which later supported survivor, survivors of sexual violence and the Me Too movement. No guesses yet. And she's currently the director of Girls for Gender Equity, an international nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening lo local communities by creating opportunities for young women, girls uh, to live self-determined lives. All right. And she was also Times, um, Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 2015. Yes, somebody guessed it right. It's Tarana Burke. Well, very close. Um, Maybe the name was a little confusing, but thank you so much, guys. It, it's been a pleasure being part of this conference and uh, please stick around. Uh, the next session will begin at 1030 in another, um, in another, another window there. Thank you, everyone.